online can see my little face at the bottom, but I'm going to stand over here so I can actually look out at the audience. Um, hey, okay. So now we'll, well, we have 12 people here and we're making progress. Anyways, um, you know, I, I usually introduce the speaker because I am chair of the department oh, right now. Can, can you hear me okay? Oh, okay. Um, but I'm the speaker today, so I guess I will introduce myself. I think you all know me, Bill Hirsch. Um, and um, I think pretty much everyone knows that I have uh, made the decision uh, after 25 years of leading what was originally the freestanding division and now the department uh, to step down from that role. I'm not retiring. Um, I am uh, plan to continue doing my teaching and research and I will continue to be the chair until an interim chair is named by the dean and um, the executive committee, which consists of uh, Karen Eden, David Dorr, Shannon McWheeney, and Cindy Morris, and Ann Marshall, the department administrator, will um, meet with the dean at, at some point and um, a decision will be made. I had always hoped that we might quickly uh, recruit a new permanent chair, but I think a combination of uh, about a half dozen other departments at the university um, having interim chairs and plus the financial circumstances of the institution um, kind of mean that the interim chair will probably be there for a year or even potentially more. Um, and I will still be around and I, I look forward to continuing all the interactions and collaborations that I have. So I, you know, I usually kind of kick off the research conference uh, each year, and so I'll do it again this year. I usually uh, have a talk called "State of the Program," but I thought, I thought that this year um, that I would kind of share um, some history, um, and so, um, but but also to leave time for discussion, and if people want to uh, make comments about. Um, where they think the department should go or, or various other kinds of things will be free to do that. So hopefully I only have maybe about um, 30 minutes most of, of slides. So, um, okay. Oh, it's not advancing. Okay, there we go. Um, some of you probably saw this meme uh, last month and it was, and it was uh, particularly apropos to me because, um, uh, you, you know, as uh, the the new um, the new chair of the um, United Kingdom, uh, King Charles, um, uh, you know, in, in his fancy garb. And then the the meme is that when you were a carefree, tenured professor living your best life, and then suddenly forced to chair your department. So I'm kind of going in the opposite direction. I'm, although. You all know I never dress that long. You know, we, we dress pretty casually around here. But anyway, so now I'm uh, aiming to become a carefree tenured professor. So, okay, so what do I hope to do this hour? Um, go away. Yeah, well, okay, anyways, so first I'm going to reflect a little bit on some of our accomplishments. And, and these slides are online. I'm happy to share them with you all. They're on my website, and then also have any kind of discussion, and it really a start of a discussion, and and obviously the discussion will continue when there's a new uh, chair of the department. So um, I know of only one person in this room who who was here pretty much from the beginning. Um, so, anyways, um, some of you may know that um, back in the 1980s there was a senator uh, from Oregon, Mark Hatfield. Um, who um, was a very senior senator, very esteemed. And back then, no matter what political party you were in, part of what you did was bring home the bacon, earmarks. And um, Hatfield, actually, because he was somewhat of an anti-war um, senator, um, he's kind of a breed of Republican that doesn't exist anymore, but we won't go into politics today. Um, anyways, he, um, uh, he was very good at... at bring earmarks to the universities around Oregon, including OHSU. In fact, that's why the building next to us has his name on it, the Hatfield Research Center. 
Um, in the mid 1980s, he saw this initiative that was from the National Library of Medicine, a legitimate uh, program that had been approved by Congress, the Integrated Advanced Information Management System or IAMS initiative. And um, he uh, added to the appropriation in the mid 80s that um, $25 million, which was actually a lot of money back then, it's still a lot of money, would go to OHSU uh, to build this building um, and to shore up, um, actually, the, the goal of IAMS was to establish computer networks because back then it was not a given that uh, health care organizations had computer networks. And it turns out OHSU actually had one just in the hospital. So this would establish a network the rest, on the rest of the campus and um, expand the library and uh, develop an academic informatics program, which we, you were supposed to do if you competitively, um, if you competed successfully to get an IAMS grant. So the IAMS grant to OHSU was awarded what they say non-competitively. It was an earmark. Um, but actually, um, the, the folks from NLM were a little aghast at first. Don, Don Lindbergh was the di director of the NLM back then and um, said to me many years later, you know, we were initially really worried about this, but, but you guys did what you're supposed to do with the IAMS program. And actually, Joan Ash and I wrote a paper in the mid-90s kind of describing that um, in the, um, uh, what was then the Bulletin of the Medical Library Association. So um, OHSU recruited the first direct, so the BIC would become a center, B-I-C-C, -C, the C stands for center, even though now the BIC is a building. And um, uh, a, a, a person who some of us in this room know, a guy named Bob Beck, was recruited from Dartmouth College, and he came along with Kent Spackman and Catherine Pyle, who many of you know, who's still here, um, and um, they started the BIC. And um, the, the building, this building opened up in, in 1991. Um, and the first occupant of the office that I currently sit in, BIC 517, was Dr. Beck. Now, um, unfortunately, um, oh, well, let me, and um, so uh, Dr. Beck came and part of his um, package was that you can recruit faculty. So he recruited these two assistant professors uh, straight out of fellowship. One was me, <laughs> one was Mark Helfand, um, who, who and both of us are still here. And, and both of us have our clinical backgrounds in internal medicine. So my initial academic appointment was in the Department of Medicine because the BIC was a center, so it's not an academic program. And um, we then recruited our first fellow, some physician out in Astoria um, who, uh, um, came and became, it, we, this was before we had the NLM grant, and so um, Dr. Gorman here was our first fellow. Um, uh, interestingly enough, both he, Mark, and myself are all from the Chicago area. Um, in fact, um, Mark and I uh, went to kindergarten and first grade together, um, although we didn't know each other then, and we actually met, we were in medical school at University of Illinois at the same time but we didn't know each other. We didn't meet each other until we got here. Um, one of the first things that Dr. Beck did was to apply for NLM funding. I was out of an NLM fellowship that was in Boston at Brigham and Women's, one of the Harvard teaching hospitals. And um, OHSU was awarded the, the beginnings of the NLM T15 grant that several of you are funded by to this day. And initially we were funded only for postdocs because we didn't have a PhD program. Also at that time, uh, Joan Ash was um, working in the library, uh, finishing her PhD at Portland State and in system science. Um, and Cindy Morris, um, who's also upstairs on the fifth floor, um, was kind of a refugee from the Department of Medicine because um, at that time, most researchers were basic science researchers. And Cindy is an epidemiologist and uh, obviously these days very well accomplished. Um, and um, she kind of fit in with the group. So this is kind of like the startup company, if you will, that uh, began uh, the, the BIC and in informatics at OHSU. We then actually had a pretty significant setback. Um, again, um, some of you might not be old enough to remember this or maybe didn't live in Oregon, but in 1990, uh, Oregon voters approved uh, Measure 5, a property tax limitation 
which um, significantly impacted the state budget. Um, the first of many, many OHSU budget crises that I've been through. But anyways, they actually had to renege on some of the commitments to Dr. Beck, and he ended up leaving, um, basically leaving myself and Kent Spackman, um, who was the other person that came with him from Dartmouth, um, as uh, pretty much the the, um, the the faculty left here. So Dr. Spackman um, became uh, the well. I, I, he didn't. I don't think he had the title as director of the BIC, but anyways, he was the second occupant of my current office upstairs. Um, but then we, um, uh, the, despite um, these uh, challenges, actually had a number of early successes. Um, some of you know of K Awards. K Awards didn't exist back then, um, but uh, NIH had this thing called an R29 or a FIRST Award, which is actually more generous than a K Award. Um, I managed to get one of those in 1990, Dr. Gorman in 95, um, and then in 97, um, uh, we became one of the uh, AHRQ-funded evidence-based practice centers, uh, initially led by Dr. Halfan, now uh, led by uh, Roger Chow. Um, and also, um, Joan Ash got her start. Um, there was actually a philanthropist that uh, gave us a small startup grant, and that uh, uh, piqued Joan's interest in studying uh, what at the time we called physician order entry, POE, uh, eventually known as CPOE, and that led to her first um, NLM R01. So, so despite the setback, um, we were off and running um, as a group. And in fact, um, the dean of the medical school at the time, Dr. Joseph Bloom, uh, really noticed that, that we were a group and, and really had no institutional visibility. And he's a psychiatrist who knows very little about informatics, but he said, you guys need to form a unit so you have some visibility. And that led to, in 1997, to the establishment of the Division of Medical Informatics and Outcomes Research, or DMIOR, or DMIOR, as maybe we called it, and I was appointed as head of it. Um, Dr. Spackman, at that point, was not really interested in leadership. Actually, he, he became very involved in SNOMED, the control terminology, um, and a number of other research areas, and then he retired about, probably it's been about 15 years ago now, but um, in any case, um, um, at a fairly young age for a um, kind of leader of an academic program, I was kind of thrust into this role because if I didn't do it, the whole thing would have collapsed. In fact, I actually had some colleagues who said, you know, if you'd like, we can try to find some way to have you soft land at our institution in our program. Um, but we were really committed to uh, continuing this. So OHSU has this construct called a freestanding division, which is basically like a department in everything but name. Um, you, you have a budget, you, um, you answer to the dean as the head of it, um, you, you have your own promotion and tenure process. So, um, and then at that point, the pieces of the BIC were kind of carved out. So um, the, the library um, moved under the provost, uh, the library is originally under the director of the BIC. The, um, the kind of computer network on the, camp, on the university side that had formed by then um, merged with the hospital computer network, which made a lot of sense. And, and that entity was renamed, as you all know it now, as ITG, the Information Technology Group. And so they, um, so it became a single uh, network. Um, Actually, a little one trivia I can tell you about the network. Um, in the early days, you could pick your email address. That's why if you've ever sent me email, you notice I'm just hirsch at ohsu.edu because that's what I chose. Um, if I were to come to OHSU today, I would be hirsch w because now it's your last name plus your first initial. So we had a lot more uh, control. And there were very few people around campus on the internet then. Um, in fact, I didn't put in the slides here, but we, we actually brought up the first OHSU web server because ITG didn't really know what the web was, this new thing in the mid-90s called the web. Anyway, so then, so the BIC was now no longer a center, it's a building, and it's been a building since then, um, and most of us uh, moved our faculty appointments. So um, I moved mine from the Department of Medicine to this new freestanding division, and um, 
And then because I was head of it, I became the third occupant of BIC 517. And at some point uh, when, when the new chair, interim or permanent decides can, can occupy that office. So then of course, we really wanted to become a department um, in the School of Medicine. And it, it took a little bit longer than we had hoped. But in 2003, um, uh, Joe Robertson, who was the Dean at that point, um, established the department. We used that opportunity to change the name, uh, the second part of the name to clinical epidemiology, because the term outcomes research was kind of falling out of favor. And clinical epidemiology really kind of describes more broadly what um, they, um, that side of the department does. Now, interestingly enough, we very rarely use medical informatics anymore. Um, but on the other hand, it's a great acronym, DMICE, you know, and everyone now around campus knows DMICE. So I don't know that we would ever want to change it. But, you know, now typically we use biomedical informatics, biomedical and health informatics, et cetera. And so I was then appointed the first chair. And then I've been the one and only chair of this department. That's another reason why I would like to step down to give others opportunities for, for leadership. Um, another thing that I learned along the way, you know, when I started, uh, you, you know, I, I trained in medicine and I went and did a NLM informatics fellowship um, after I trained in internal medicine. And I figured I would be a faculty at an academic medical center, and um, I looked at a few jobs, but actually OHSU was the, um, the I thought had the best long-term opportunity, so that's why I came here. Even I said, first time I ever set foot in Oregon was my job interview. I grew up in the Chicago area and did my fellowship in Boston. Um, and, you know, I got that R29 grant, and I was doing my research and information retrieval, but I was always a little bit interested in teaching and education, but I never realized it. And so it turns out um, that the Masters of Public Health program started uh, back in, in the early 1990s. Um, and um, actually, Ken Spackman arranged for an elective in their program to, to basically be an introductory informatics course. And that, that actually is the beginnings of what's known as BMI 510 and, and 10 by 10. I'll talk about that in a moment for those who don't know. Um, and um, Kent, I think, did it for like a year. And then he's like, I don't want to do this anymore. And I'm like, oh, I'll do it. And um, um, I have literally been teaching that introductory course um, for uh, you know, almost 30 years now. Um, and um, because I'm very meticulous about backing up my data. I, I have the handouts and the slides. It'd be a great um, dissertation project someday for a PhD student to do a kind of content analysis of the whole thing going forward. Uh, in fact, I actually, I'll show you on the next slide the curriculum from the first time that I led the course. Um, all, around that time, um, there was interest, not only from me, but I was very interested in, in pushing it. And actually, I had some nice mentorship from um, Leslie Halleck, who was the provost at the time. She uh, retired from OHSU and about 10 years ago became the president of Pacific University. In fact, she retired from that last year. Um, and she was very helpful, uh, not so much from the informatics standpoint, but navigating the whole state approval process, which we had to go through. And we started planning our first graduate program, which we thought we would start with a master's degree, and including the possibility um, that um, NLM postdocs could uh, do the master's degree. So it was called the Master of Science in Medical Informatics. It got approved. And in 1996, we opened our doors and seven students arrived. Um, we actually had some funding to actually pay all of their tuition for like the first year or two. And, and that got us started. And we started teaching in this room. Um, and um, the courses in the department had the M-I-N-F pre prefix. So my introductory course changed from Public Health 549 to M-I-N-F 510. And we had our first graduates of the program in um, 1998. And um, that was the first time I actually ever went to OHSU graduation. And um, 
I've gone almost every year since then, and um, I, I make it a point to go, as some of you know. So I don't know if anyone can read this. Um, so this is a, actually this is a Word document. You know, Word won't open up documents that are this old. This is from 1993. Um, but I was able to open it in text edit and then copy the text out. Anyways, you probably can't read it, but it's really interesting to look at the topics. Medical decision making, medical data and information analysis. There's nothing in there about electronic health records. There, there, there is about expert systems and decision support tools, which is kind of what we, how we described AI. Although 1993 was the well into the AI winter, that kind of the, the, the depth of the first generation of AI. But people were still building expert systems and building clinical decision support into electronic health records. But there's nothing there about health information exchange or machine learning or uh, anything like that. But I just thought I'd show that to you. Let's see how I'm doing time-wise. Okay, well then, um, this uh, our success, um, and, and I, it's clearly a team effort. I was at the head of it, but um, I, I never would have been able to do it by myself. So um, we we did a lot of other things. Um, many of these um, that that were came out of my passion for education. Um, one was even in the late 1990s, people started asking, "Could we take your courses online?" And um, I, you know, I was always interested in educational technology. So we actually converted MINF 510 to an online format. In fact, we used to offer two completely separate sections of it. And um, the fall of 1999 was actually the first offering of that course online. And then we thought, um, and then the, the people who took it, you know, can we take more? Um, we didn't actually think initially that people would want to get a full master's degree online, so that's why we created the graduate certificate. Um, and then so that too we had to shepherd through the state approval process and it launched in 2000. Um, we had always wanted to add a PhD program and there were enough faculty by then to do so. And so we, um, when we did the renewal for the, the NLM T15 in 2000, must have been in 2001 because it was funded in 2002 um, and it's funded every five years, which 2022, we just started the seventh cycle. Um, so the, the T15 was renewed actually with, for the first time we asked for pre-doctoral slots um, in anticipation of the PhD program. Um, another thing that happened that year was um, because there was enough interest in, in the, um, in having an online master's degree, we went ahead and put the whole uh, master's program online. And we, um, we set it up as a non-thesis master's. At, at that point, a lot of people were talking about professional master's degree. I mean, they still do, but that, that term was used a lot. So it would be a non-thesis master of medical informatics or MMI. Um, so then in 2000, so then also we were, once we got the NLM grant renewed, we started working on building and getting approved the PhD program. And that was approved in 2003. And we used that opportunity to at least move, change the name of the educational program, not the department, but the educational program became biomedical informatics, meaning that my introductory course now became BMI 510. And um, <clears throat> So we started um, uh, doing that. Uh, we we had a we had a growing number of bioinformatics courses um, before Shannon was here. Um, a guy named Chris Dubay uh, was on our faculty and developed some of those courses. But it was really Shannon who kind of um, really took took the reins and uh, we really created a whole new track in the program called um, Bioinformatics and Computational Biology, or BCB, which some of you are in. And, um, and Shannon was the uh, head of that uh, track. We, um, we, actually I didn't, I should mention it here, we, we changed the name of the other track initially to Clinical Informatics, um, the, the one that we now call HCIN, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, one of our first PhD students was a real go-getter, and he came from Stanford, and he had a lot of courses, graduate courses under his belt already, so was able to, to whiz through and also set the bar really high for the PhD program. So Adam Wright, who now is a, a professor of biomedical informatics at Vanderbilt, um, has done 
amazing work over the years in clinical decision support. He was our first PhD graduate. Um, and, and then also in 2007, Dr. Spackman finally, he decided at that point, I don't want to do the uh, NLM grant anymore. So that with that cycle that, that must have started in 2006, I became the PI of the NLM grant. Um, and another thing we did, and you can see from that lower picture, is that we hosted the uh, NLM trainees meeting that some of you went to, and actually Jennifer won an award at. And um, uh, we were actually, m most of you know, we're supposed to host it again in 2020, but there was a pandemic that came along and kiboshed that. So we, we actually put on a virtual uh, NLM meeting. And then I just just my mentioning of going to graduation that this picture is from 2002. You can see Paul there, Cindy Morris, myself, Karen, um, Judy Logan, who um, is an emeritus member of our faculty and was a graduate in the very first master's degree class. She was um, a physician and then did the master's program and then joined our faculty uh, and taught uh, courses and did research for many years and then retired about five or seven years ago, um, and Joan. So um, I, I, I was digging through my archives for pictures and I came across this one. Um, so, and then um, I could go on and on and about the, about the uh, educational accomplishments. I'll, I'll just uh, mention some of the highlights. So um, some of you know that I also am involved in this program with the American Medical Informatics Association called 10 by 10. And uh, AMIA, our professional association, wanted to have an online course, and they talked to vendors that wanted to charge them an arm and a leg. And by 2005, we had already been teaching uh, BMI 510 online for a half decade. So I said to my colleagues at AMIA, why don't we take this course and, and repackage it as a standalone course? And um, uh, we had to involve the lawyers a little bit just to kind of set the terms of the agreement <clears throat> and basically came up with this mutually non-exclusive thing where AMIA could have other 10 by 10 courses and then um, we would keep the intellectual property of the BMI 510 course. And that worked out really well. Uh, we had a congressman um, in the, he actually resigned in disgrace, but in the, in the 2000s, uh, actually introduced in the 2009, 2008-2009 um, congressional session, HR 461, the 10,000 train by 2010 act. And it actually passed the House, but it never got taken up in the Senate. So, um, uh, but it, it would have kind of established funding for training in informatics. <clears throat> but the, the big thing that happened, and in fact, I was just at a meeting last week um, in Nashville, hearing physicians complain about, appropriately so, complain about how awful their EHRs are. Um, and, you know, that all was facilitated by the High Tech Act. And I, I really look back, and I, I think probably one of the biggest historical events for our field was the High Tech Act, <coughs> which, as probably you all know, was part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act because. Um, the economy was tanking, and uh, Barack Obama had just become president. That's, that's wow, that was a long time ago. Um, and um, <clears throat> House Resolution 1, H.R. 1, was the Recovery Act that had um, the High Tech Act embedded within it because they were looking for shovel-ready projects. And at, at that point, there was a lot of research that had come out that showed that Clinical decision support, EHRs could reduce errors, potentially save money, um, uh, make healthcare more efficient. You know, of course, as we look back in retrospect, it didn't totally work out that way. Um, but anyways, the High Tech Act um, uh, provided $30 billion in incentives for institutions, including OHSU, to um, adopt electronic health records. OHSU actually already had EPIC by then. Um, but you you could still get the money if you met the meaningful use criteria. Um, I think one of the only times a dean has ever called me into their office was when the dean called me in and said, what, what's this high tech act and meaningful use? And if, how can we get this $13 million that would come to OHSU? Um, 
I would like to think that he would have called me in for other more important things. Anyways, um, so in addition to the 30 billion, there was actually 118 million for workforce development. And some of that was actually influenced by some of the research and writings that, that I had done, um, honestly. <laughs> um, in fact, people thought the whole thing was wired for OHSU, but it wasn't. But we, we did, we wrote the grants um, just like everyone else, and they went through a competitive review process. And um, we were awarded um, $5.8 million. Um, there were five curriculum development centers to develop the ONC Health IT curriculum. They then designated a national training and dissemination center to um, work. And this, these curricula were developed for these short-term training programs in community colleges. Um, we were appointed the National Training and Dissemination Center. Um, and then also we got additional funding from the university-based training, which gave additional funding, um, mostly for kind of graduate certificate kind of work uh, and, um, and, and also our MBI program. Um, so th this, um, for, for the few years starting around 2010, that this was a major part of my life. Um, and, um, you know, I, I mean, I look back on it now, it's, it, you know, it's almost a decade ago, but it, it really was an amazing time. A anyway, so the, the, um, the High Tech Act funding ended and we continued on. Um, we were able to add some things to the program to expand it, actually like Virginia Lankies, who unfortunately um, uh, has retired. Um, she came about through this, uh, some of the other things we had done. So some of the legacy of it lives on. Um, another, uh, the, and th this history is incomplete, but I, I'm just pointing to some real high highlights here. Another big highlight um, was, um, I see some of our CI fellows here, uh, um, when the new clinical informatics subspecialty fellowship for physicians was launched, um, you know, we, we were involved in that from the get-go. Um, we were one of the first four fellowship programs funded. Um, in the, at the very beginning, I was the program director, but the intent always was for Vishnu to direct the program, and he's done a tremendous job with it. I guess one other um, thing I can point to is um, in 2018, the, the provost decided that our tracks were actually really distinct programs and said, you should call these majors. So that's when we changed clinical informatics to HCIN. And that's why those of you in HCIN are in the HCIN major. And those of you in BCB are in the BCB major. Um, and we also, I, I lobbied Shannon to change the computational biology to computational biomedicine, which I think she wanted to do. Um, but in any case, um, we did that. Um, we've had a lot of other great um, educational grants over the years, just to mention a few of these. So, um, again, uh, some of you may have been around long enough, but for a while we had uh, a bunch of uh, physicians from Argentina, pretty much as NLM fellows. They, they did the same kind of fellowship. That was a grant from the NIH Fogarty International Center to develop global health informatics. Um, there was a, one more round of ONC funding to update the curriculum in uh, around 2015. And in fact, those uh, one of the unfortunate things about curriculum development grants is if there's not resources to keep the curriculum developed, it just sits there and gets stale. So you can click on that link and you can go see this curriculum that is about four or five years old now. Um, we also uh, about, it must have been what about, uh, almost eight years ago, the, um, the first of the many NIH forays into big data and data science. So NIH had a program, Big Data to Knowledge, BD2K. And um, we did, we got some additional curriculum development funded um, and, and also um, got a second grant that was led by David Doerr um, to develop a skills course. And um, so, and, and actually, uh, Melissa Handel, who some of you know, who's no longer here, she was involved in this. Uh, Shannon was also involved. And we uh, developed this big data curriculum, and it too sits out there on our website, but um, not really kept up to date. Um, one other grant I would point to that's not in our department, 
but um, was important to us is the the AMA grant, uh, uh, AMA, the American Medical Association grant. Uh, um, uh, that um, it, the AMA, um, <clears throat> you know, historically was like the physicians' trade union, but actually in the last uh, decade or so, a AMA has gotten interested in medical education and even physician well-being and things like that. But they they funded these educational these uh, uh, accelerating change in medical education grants and. Um, Paul and I managed to convince George Maicano to put a piece in there about informatics. And, and actually, Dr. Maicano, who actually just left OHSU, um, was really the first um, educational dean to kind of open the door of the MD curriculum to um, uh, uh, clinical informatics. And, and so that was a great opportunity. Um, and, and actually, um, I, a bunch of, I, I see Gretchen uh, back there too, a bunch of these grants kind of uh, uh, worked out well for her and she continues to, <laughs> to, yeah, to work. We, we benefited from having her. Yes, uh, we have very much benefited from having Gretchen um, uh, maintaining the medical school curriculum and doing other things in the department. A anyways, th th this was a big deal because back in the 90s, I, you know, I used to say, well, we should, our, you know, medical students should know something about informatics and, uh, you know, we'll go talk to the course directors, Bill, and then the course directors would say, well, not, you know, I, yeah, it's probably important, but not in my course, or, um, you know, we don't have room for it in my course, or another thing I got is, oh, they're all digital natives, you know, they know how to do instant messenger and email, and I was like, no, that's not informatics, and, um, but it was finally Dr. May Kano who opened the door for us. Um, so where are we today? I, I guess I'm taking a little bit longer than I had uh, planned, but anyways. Um, uh, so um, we have students who take our classes actually all over the world. Um, actually, this map is a little old, but David Doerr generated this uh, probably about seven or eight years ago from t taking the, I think, the zip codes of our online students. Um, I always... Uh, periodically take pictures of the, even though we don't always publish these in paper anymore, but all the theses and dissertations. And we are closing in on a thousand degrees and certificates awarded, um, mostly ACN, but, but still plenty of BCB. And um, so we continue to move along. Um, my 10 by 10 course has also been a success. It, you know, it's 10 by 10 stood for 10,000 trained by 2010 because we started in 2005. We didn't hit 10,000. I, I never thought we would, but it was kind of an aspirational goal. But there was continued interest in it, particularly after the High Tech Act. And just this year, we have surpassed 3,000 people who have done 10 by 10. And those people who take this course can actually take the BMI 510 exam and get, um, and if they get a sufficiently high grade, get credit for BMI, 10, BMI 510 and use that to enroll in the HCIN program, and um, um, many of this, probably several hundred, or maybe not several, uh, maybe two or three hundred over the years. Now, maybe more like two hundred at most. Anyways, um, so um, um, the introductory course has also um, uh, been uh, successful in other ways. So um, I had uh, the dean's office go into Banner and generate a report on everyone who's taken BMI 510 and all of its predecessors. And so we're now like over 1,600 of all time. Um, we've done some other kind of customized offerings. And um, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, when the dean's office and other medical schools started saying, we, we need virtual learning opportunities for medical students. So, you know, I have this one size fits all. And it turns out it, it fits nicely into a two week block for medical students. And so in the early days of the pandemic, a couple hundred medical students from 17 students, finally, I, I had to say enough, um, but it's still available as an elective to medical students. And I have a, a few who are in the course right now. Um, and um, I think another testament of our success, people, some of you can see your names on this, are, um, and, and this, I hope this list is complete. I, I apologize if I missed anyone. Um, but these are all the people uh, who have done the educational program and are now faculty in some way. Some of them are adjunct, affiliate, some are emeritus. 
Um, but we have had graduates before the NLM fellowship, <clears throat> um, the NLM postdoc, Aaron is sitting there, um, the master's degree, that's how Vishnu came into the program. Then we finally started um, having pre-doc um, uh, PhD students join the faculty, uh, the Clinical Informatics Fellowship, to uh, so far of the graduates of that. Um, and, and, and even though he didn't do informatics training, I, I felt I should put David's uh, name here. He, he did his internal medicine residency here. And he, um, so he trained at OHSU, although not in informatics. We couldn't convince him to stay. He went off to the University of Utah. He did I mean, elect. He did an elective. Okay, great. Okay. And again, I apologize if this I, if list is not complete. Um, so, you know, I also, I've said a lot about education. I also do research. Most of you know I do research and in information retrieval. Um, I'm proud of my H Google Scholar H index of 76 it is now. Um, I've published this book. Oh, and actually, I, I forgot to mention on, on this slide. Um, I took over the editorship of this book from uh, Dr. Robert Hoyt, and we just published the eighth edition. You can go look at it upstairs. There's a copy of it sitting um, on Monica's desk, um, and you could even buy it if you want. And um, uh, the, uh, so in addition to a lot of uh, articles and so forth, I've published, uh, um, I've also had this passion about information retrieval, and, um, and actually, I, had, I was already working on it when the pandemic hit, and I finished it up in the fourth edition at, um, in 2020. Um, that was um, published in mid-2020. So uh, once the pandemic hit, I had a lot of time to work on it. So um, <clears throat> just a few things about the department um, that um, I, I think it's safe to say that we are recognized nationally and internationally as leaders in biomedical informatics and clinical epidemiology. Um, I, didn't, I haven't said much about the Evidence-Based Practice Center, which actually tomorrow is having an event to celebrate its 25th uh, anniversary, which was the same year we became the freestanding uh, division. That's when they first got their funding. Um, many faculty have been successful, and we'll have to find a way someday to summarize all that. Um, we do have the four vice chairs of the department that I mentioned at the beginning, um, and of course, we um, nothing would happen in this department without the uh, tremendous uh, administrative staff uh, led by um, Ann, who's the department administrator, and Andrea, who heads up the educational program, and all the people who work under them. And I will state their names, but I know I'm going to forget someone. But um, under Ann is is uh, Monica, uh, Alicia our currently unfilled financial analyst person. And then under Andrea is um, Lynn and Lauren and Vanessa. And am I forgetting anyone? I probably am. Um, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking of the desks upstairs. A anyways, and, and I suppose another person who should be mentioned here, although she's also faculty, is Catherine Pyle, who has an administrative role in, in helping us apply for our grants, but she also teaches our uh, scientific writing course. So all, all of those people are really the, the, the what keeps the department going. Um, I'm also proud of the fact that we have a very sustained, strong record of uh, research grant funding. You actually see that one peak, which is right around the High Tech Act, because not only did we get the, the educational grants, but there was a lot of money thrown into research at that time. So like many units, we went back down, but we continue to um, uh, trend back upwards. And all told, um, the department has generated over $200 million in um, grant funding since 1997. Um, I would also point out that our T15 training grant is the um, largest and second longest running training grant at OHSU. And there are um, if you count the summer interns and some of the other people who've been funded, actually 131 trainees, and the grant over the years has uh, brought in $22 million. So um, we're, we're good for the Oregon economy. So um, I had hoped to finish a little bit sooner, but that's okay. Um, so some of you might ask, well, what are you going to do, Bill, now that you're no longer chair? Um, and um, uh, I have plenty to do. I, I plan to continue all my teaching and research, so I will continue teaching the introductory course. 
Um, some of you know, I have an R01 that, with Steve Bedrick um, and um, uh, collaborators at Mayo Clinic and University of Texas Houston that's funded through 2026 to look at information retrieval applied to patient records for cohort identification. Um, last year, I was awarded uh, in collaboration with the University of Cape Town, uh, part of a grant from uh, NIH's uh, Data Science Initiative for Africa. I'll actually be in Cape Town in a few weeks. Um, obviously, there is the training grant. I will, in fact, hopefully have more time for that. Um, some of you also know we were just awarded an R25 from the NLM. Um, because the NIH rules changed around summer interns, we can't fund them with the training grant. So NLM has had a separate R25 call for proposals. We managed to get funded, and um, so that will continue our R25 with a particular focus on historically underrepresented um, students in the field. Um, there, there's a component with Portland State and the Build Exit Out program. Um, and then, <clears throat> that's probably enough to keep me going, but I also have my collaborations. Um, I'm involved with Karen's uh, Mammo Screen project. Um, Aaron and I collaborate. Uh, we've, we've managed to uh, uh, get some industry funding the last several years to look at uh, searching for rare diseases through EHR data. Um, Jeff Gold and Vishnu Mohan have an EHR simulation grant that I'm uh, involved with. And then another grant that was that just came to the department um, that David Dorr is our um, OHSU um, lead um, in this new Bridge to AI initiative. There, there, you may have seen the press release that was in OHSU now a, a week or two ago. So um, when I'm no longer chair, I will still have plenty to do. Um, so at some point, I will just delete out, I'll just be professor. Uh, but for right now, I'm still chair. So I'm going to stop at this point and um, open the floor to any comments, uh, questions. Um, I can look and see if there's anything in the chat. Um, let's see. Um, uh, uh, oh, Kate has a Cliff Notes version, uh, history of, of DMICE. Um, and um, Vishnu's contributions to Zoom backgrounds. Anyways, um, <laughs> um, so um, thank you for in indulging me and in listening to this. And um, you know, it's it's been a lot of fun, and and I hope to keep building on it. And I hope that the new leadership will have the opportunity to keep things growing. So, any comments or um, suggestions? Yeah, Paul. Your, your graphic of where people came from should be global. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, another is um, uh, such a picture of the uh, U.S. with all our uh, Wendy. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Peter MB, he's probably our most distinguished graduate. He's now the chair of informatics at Vanderbilt. Well, not not a black hole, no. but a um, they yeah. yeah yeah they they suck everything in. Yeah. They do a great job of it. Kudos to them. <laughs> Congratulations to you, Black. The first thing here, there was a flyer in a computer store in town. It said there was a conference at OHSU, which I went to, and then I went to meet Bob back in the city, and these two people he had recruited. I should come to a fellowship. One was Mark Helfer. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, actually, another thing, I, I, there, there's plenty of other things I could put in. You know, Bob Beck was very enamored by the next machine. You know, that was the, com that was the computer that Steve Jobs, it, when he left Apple um, initially, you know, he, of course, he eventually came back, but um, the next machine, and, and Bob Beck had bought like, 50 of them or something like that, and they were all over the place, and we were using them. I mostly stuck with my Mac, but. Yeah. So. You, you mean the Evidence-Based Practice Center? 
No, no, no. Well, PCORI is a is a um, national program. PCORI it, it funds um, patient centered outcomes research, also known as comparative effectiveness research. It's a it's a actually it's a actually you guys probably know more than I do. It's a it's a yeah quasi. It, it's actually funded from the Affordable Care Act. Um, so Obamacare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, PCORI is a separate thing. There now the evidence-based practice center is currently called the Pacific Northwest Evidence-Based Practice Center because they have collaborators up in Seattle. Um, but that's not all of cl clinical epidemiology. It's a large part of clinical epidemiology, but it's not all of it. Um, all of the work that Annette does so is also well, and it also bleeds over into informatics. <laughs> Derp, yeah, drug, yeah, that that yeah, that project doesn't exist anymore. But the there were related to the evidence-based practice center, 15 states and the province of Ontario um, kind of banded together to do evidence-based reviews of drug categories. And um, I think yeah, for Medicaid programs. And we did a lot of them, or did we do all of them? Yeah, yeah. And um, that, so that was a big, uh, Mary McDonough, that was uh, who, who, another person who recently, well, not that recent, retired last year, um, was the head of that. So let's see, Homer Chin. Homer Chin, who's also been a, a fixture in informatics in um, Portland, he's one of our uh, affiliate faculty, it was for many years the head of, um, uh, was uh, he wasn't called it, but he's basically the CMIO of the local Kaiser, was the medical director for informatics or something like that. And when Kaiser was spending like a billion dollars with IBM trying to build a medical record, Homer was up here implementing this thing called Epic. <laughs> and of course, now that's what's used all throughout Kaiser. And, and he's made many contributions to our program. So thank you, Homer. Thank you for your <laughs> kind, <clears throat> kind words. Um, and um, yeah, Vishnu um, mentions that uh, running into um, DMICE alumni. I do as well. I also run into 10 by 10. Like I, I, numerous times I've been like in an airport and someone, hey, Bill, I took 10 by 10 from you three years ago. And they don't have their name tag on, so I can't remember exactly who they are. Um, but, um, you know, as you all know, OHSU is very well known in informatics and will hopefully benefit, especially the trainees when they go looking for jobs and so forth. <laughs> Bill knows everyone in the, I, mean, I know a lot of people, that is true. <laughs> Friends of Bill, as we used to say in the 1990s. A different Bill. Yeah, Thailand, yeah, sure. Yeah. How involved was the research Yeah, yes. You know, um, well, I guess we're broadcasting publicly, but but may, maybe because I'm advanced enough in my career, I can air some, well, it's not really dirty laundry. It's just an opinion. Um, one of the, <clears throat> well, Many, some people would argue there's many unfortunate things about the transition from VISTA to Cerner, but one of the clear unfortunate things is that VISTA, the electronic health record for the VA, is, like, is unlike almost any other government IT project. You know, most government IT projects are done from the top down. I mean, that, that's why the Obamacare website failed, because they came up with the specifications and they, they hired, you know, some IT firm and they did it wrong. And there were other problems too. Um, but the, the VA, the VISTA system really benefited from this rich informatics community throughout the VA system. And they're still mostly there. Um, but you know what happened here when they saw Cerner coming, they just didn't think they needed that anymore, which I think was a terrible mistake. Um, and um, so a number, um, uh, Blake Lesselroth was someone who left. Um, fortunately, Alicia is still here. Um, and, um, but, you know, I think it's unfortunate that um, there could be some really good fellowship 
actually not only clinical informatics fellowship, but all, all opportunities for all of our students to do things at the VA, e even to be part of the new transition, which they're not that much a part of, um, uh, is, is unfortunate. So we'll see what happens with the VA. I mean, it's, you know, the uh, Portland VA was supposed to be the third VA for Cerner, and it was supposed to be live in 2020. And what are they saying now? 23? And I think they're um, talking about. So, yeah. Aaron. And I think there are still opportunities. In the yeah. Yes, that yes, that's right. Yeah, data analytics. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you know, actually, the VISTA actually has its warts, you know, it's it's not as standards based as it could be. Um, there's a few other issues, you know, some people say it's older technology, although it sits on top of mumps, which is also what Epic sits on top of. Um, <clears throat> the, um, but yeah, you know, you're right, there are, and there are kind of data analytical kinds of opportunities at the VA, like what Gianji does, like what Eilish does, and Eilish has a big new sleep grant, so there, there's a lot of opportunity. But the opportunity to do kind of care and feeding of the EHR is unfortunately, I don't think is is there as at least as much as it used to be. And and you know, the, the VA system really evolved because there was this grassroots countrywide, you know, almost every major VA, you know, had an informatics um, physician and 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 other in, informaticians. And some of you know some of those folks. Very distributed. Yeah. Italy. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, almost, <clears throat> and and technically it is open source, but um, it's not like you can just download it, run it. But um, it it, it kind of had the flavor of an open source thing, where you know Portland would develop a new sepsis module or something like that, and and then the national VA might decide to incorporate it into the system. There's, I see, um, so Kate asked them, how difficult is it for an outsider? I actually think we're a pretty friendly group. Um, and, um, um, you know, we, uh, we, you know, we go to meetings like AMIA and meet with people and, um, you know, we, we, we always try to, and, and this year we'll be putting on a dessert reception at the AMIA meeting and we invite all of our um, students and alumni and, <laughs> friends of Bill. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, so for any of you who are going to the AMIA meeting, it's it's on Monday night at eight o'clock and, um, you know, you're welcome to come. Um, and then this year, I'm, ex I'm also inviting all of the people who contributed chapters to the, the new edition of the book. Anything else? <clears throat> it's actually, we are actually about at the hour, so okay. Well, again, thank you all for listening. And, um, you know, like I said, I will will be around. And um, I, I, like you, will wait for the white smoke to come out of the chimney on the top of the building when the new. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. See you all later. Bye bye. Yeah, you know, when the 